Okay, we're going to get off the ground now uh, and uh, go to space. Uh, so Sven Herman is our next speaker. He's a research scientist at CAPAC. He's a senior member of the X-ray Astronomy and Observational Cosmology Group here. Uh, he's also a principal engineer at Brookhaven National Lab. And he's going to tell us about uh, upcoming X-ray missions in space uh, and uh, CCD technology uh, and its evolution going into the future. Okay. <clears throat> Hello. This seems to work. Um, so yeah, thank you for the opportunity to present the work of our group here. Um, I also appreciate very much uh, uh, mentioning readout. LSST readout certainly is a completely different scale of things. Um, and uh, it can indeed read out electronics, read out architectures. How do we actually get the signal out of the detector most efficient um, is a transforming technology. Um, this one is focused on, on, on space applications. Um, okay, so that's our small hardware group. Um, Tanmoy, Peter, uh, Glenn, Artem, Haley, yes, then also me and Steve Allen. Um, and you see our lab in uh, in B11. There's now actually a big beam line um, on the back of this optical table. And I have a picture later in this as we are building up our lab with more and more hardware. Um, and these are actually readout chips here in front. This box, which you see there, um, these carrier boxes, they're ASICs, uh, which we designed and had fabricated. Okay. Um, so driver, um, there's two main drivers for our work, which is large flagship style um, X-ray telescopes. One is the European Athena, um, the Advanced Telescope for High Energy Astrophysics. Uh, Athena uh, is going to launch something around 2035 and has two main instruments on it. Um, the WFI, the Wide Field Imager, and the XIFO, the X-ray Integral Field Unit. The um, integral field unit is around 3,000 pixels. They are cryogenic uh, detectors, you know, ultra high energy resolution, like three EV, something like that. Um, and this is cryogenic test squid. I'm not going into this. There is a uh, talk later about um, these detectors across the AM band, and I guess uh, X-rays will be mentioned. Um, I'm focusing on what we are actually working, which is the WFI, the wide field imager, that is a silicon imager, but it's not a CCD and it's not a CMOS either. Um, I would argue it's it's a more advanced form than even a CMOS detector. It's called a depth fed imager. Um, the Europeans have made that. The Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics has developed this. Um, it has rather large pixels through 130 micrometers. Um, Field of view of this camera is 40 arc minutes, um, 130 EV full width half maximum at the iron line is state of the art in silicon. That's pretty much, you know, uh, physics limit, final limited performance. And the thing does uh, 200 frames per second, which is quite fast as you will see with a region of interest, which could go as fast as 10,000 frames per second. It really sort of sets the, the mark there. That said, it's only one megapixel and going forward, we basically are looking for something bigger. So the other mission is AXIS, um, the Advanced X-ray Imaging Satellite. That's a US mission uh, currently being proposed as part of the probe uh, class call, the APEX. Um, and here, um, we, we are looking for an eight megapixel camera, much smaller pixels, 24 micrometers, which results in a much better uh, resolution, half an arc second per pixel, um, same energy resolution, but now, and the frame rate of 20 frames per second, uh, but as I said, keep in mind, this is a much bigger detector, eight times the pixel size and the, uh, eight times the pixels, and the pixels are much smaller. So the information density is much higher, and that is a challenge for the readout. The other points for AXIS is, um, I mean, AXIS basically does everything better than Chandra. You see here the plot. In almost all the regimes, it's around 10 times better. I heard today 10 times or uh, fast. It's not always 10 times, sometimes it's just five, but this is engineering, 10 times as hard. The only point here um, where you might think of, oh, but resolution, it's not as good as Chandra. Well, this is simplified. If you actually look at the uh, off-axis performance of Chandra, you see that the point spread function is a little bit better than axis, but it degrades really fast. While axis basically stays at an excellent resolution for almost the full field of view, and that then reflects in the grasp at one and a half arc seconds, being much, much higher. Um, so overall, this machine is a super Chandra. Okay. 
Um, good. So um, now we come to the readout. So we heard CCDs. Yeah, I probably agree. LSST might be the last really large optical CCD camera. There will be technologies after that. That said, CCDs are not dead yet. And for these X-ray missions, um, the situation currently is that CCDs are the detector that can deliver all the performance, the energy resolution, the stability, the precision, um, the, the reliability, and all these things. Um, but maybe they have a problem with the speed, especially as that if you have so many pixels. So it's basically they have a problem with the, um, uh, with the readout rate. And so in order to push readout rate, um, you can make one readout faster, right? Uh, the number of readouts you have, you just push them to be faster. And the second one is more parallelization. So you make more nodes to read out. And the thing is like, we have to do both. So you need detectors with many outputs. You already seen this, 16 outputs on, on LSST, for instance. Um, this is more than traditionally have been used. Um, and then higher speed per output. And that in turn means that traditional readout electronics usually isn't doing it anymore because of the density, um, the size, and also the power. And so you want to have microelectronics. You want to integrate this into an ASIC dedicated for the purpose in order to harvest uh, size, speed, performance. Okay. Good. Um, so the other thing is like, because it's engineering, I mean, we, we try to leverage um, foundries. We try to leverage, you know, industrial scale foundries. So detectors for access, for instance, um, would be coming from MIT Lincoln Labs. MIT Lincoln Labs is a huge lab. They have a dedicated microelectronics clean room. They are moving thousands of wafers through this clean room every year. Um, this is a $1 billion total at Lincoln Labs, not just the microelectronics room, but in total. Um, and so they really do this at, at, at a massive industrial scale, but you, the process technology can be optimized for our application. The other one is our uh, chips, the, the ASICs, the readout chips. They come also from an uh, industrial process, in this case, XFAP. XFAP is another company in the billion dollar class. Um, and they are focusing on analog circuits. You know, it's not the seven nanometer high performance computing chips. No, this one is, is silicon, which is intended for analog signal, maximizing signal to noise ratio, maximizing um, the, 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 the milliwatts spent per bits gained. Um, and so this is our other uh, partner. I said, this is important. You have reliable processes you can uh, manufacture in scale. Okay. Um, and so the development approach to solve this is sort of a multiple columns. Um, on one hand, you need the detectors. I said, the CCDs come from Limpo Lab. The depth feds um, are done by not industrial scale, but quite large scale semiconductor fabrication laboratory run by the Max Planck Society. Um, then in order to use this detector, so we said we need readout ASICs and we are developing two chips, one for Athena, one for Axis. Um, and then you also need a set test setup. You need actually something in your lab where you can put the detector and everything in and make representative measurements in order to feed this back. Simulations alone don't do the job, especially at the interface. I can simulate the detector, I can simulate the, the ASIC, but interface questions are often very hard to simulate. You have to measure them and then you can put it back into the simulation. Um, and then last but not least, um, digital waveform filtering. Um, we, we now enter the, the, the area where again, paradigm shift, um, analog signal processing comes to an end. And we, we start employing digital signal processing now also for this. You already do this in your mobile phones and everywhere. The world is full of digital signal processing, but in our field, it has not yet been employed at that scale. Okay. So this is a test setup as we had it. We call it the, the tiny box actually, because it's pretty small. Um, this is a tiny uh, vacuum chamber with a detector. The, the black thing there uh, on the gold carrier, that's actually a 512 by 512 pixel detector. Um, there's a vacuum feed through board and it goes into this black thing, which is our CCD Archon controller. Um, and now the next one is a little bit bigger. <laughs> so that's our upgrade to our setup. Um, this is on the optical table I shown you before. So there's a three meter beam line. There's an X-ray tube at the end, which has uh, quite some juice so that we can illuminate with enough X-rays and of various energies. And then not yet in this picture is the space for the detector chamber, which will also get a high powered cryo cooler so that we can really cool these things down. So as I said, we are upgrading our test setup. 
um, for more capabilities. Okay, now talking readout. Um, so I, I have this in here for basically a video waveform um, because I refer it a bit more often. So a classical CCD output and your CMOS sensors are not so different when we talk about the output. There is usually a thing which collects the electrons um, and then the electrons go on a transistor and the transistor basically amplifies those electrons and makes a signal out of it, either a voltage or a current. And so this looks like this, that you, you have to reset the thing, you have to put it into an empty condition, and then you measure the baseline, and then you can move the charge. In a CCD, you shift the charge. In a CMOS sensor, you also transfer the charge. You move the charge on the node, and then because it's electrons, and I show this here in voltage, um, signal goes down. And then the difference between this and that that is the proportional to the number of electrons which you collected. So that's proportional to your signal. That's what you want to measure. And then after that, you have to reset the thing again to make it empty. Um, and then the cycle starts again. That's the basic video waveform. Um, and as said, CCDs operate like this, but even CMOS sensors operate like that. Okay. And now when you want to go faster, so this shows the video waveform here um, at 2 megahertz, 3 megahertz, and 4 megahertz. And as you can see, at 2 megahertz, it looks pretty much like my comic picture on the previous page, right? You see the reset, you see the baseline, you see the signal. Now, as we go faster, <laughs> the video waveform gets a little bit more ugly, right? And at 4 megahertz, it's like, wait a moment, where's my baseline here? <laughs> this is just one <clears throat> mess. Um, you also see that the reset actually takes a bigger and bigger fraction of the total readout time because it doesn't scale as well, at least not in this setup. So these are the problems when you want to, you know, speed this thing up. Nevertheless, I mean, we, we got, so these detectors previously were operated like LSST at 500 kilopixel, two microseconds readout. We operated them at eight, at four megapixel. That's eight times as fast. And we still have, you know, an energy resolution below 150 EV, which in my business, if you do in silicon below 150 EV, it's usable. 130 EV is great. 150 EV is usable. So we can speed this up by a factor of eight and still be usable. That's already, you know, something. Um, now, the thing is, if you want to go faster than that, you hit these problems of the parasitic capacitance, the waveform is too slow, the, uh, the reset uh, clock driver is too slow. And so now you actually have to design new electronics. And so um, you, you need a new PCB and you have to think about a dedicated readout asset. And so, this is the ASIC, or at least one of the two which we are doing, um, the one which on the speed front I think is a bit more exciting. Um, so this is MCRC. Um, it's an eight channel chip. You see here the chip. You see it's pad limited actually. It has, you know, uh, we, we need a lot of space for all the pads and the analog core in the center it is actually smaller, but that's often in this business. Um, it has this analog core, it has digital logic to control everything, and then it has differential outputs, um, has eight channels integrated. <clears throat> And the focus of this is low input capacitance because low capacitance means you know fast RC times, which means fast readout. Um, and then the second one is low power, obviously, because if those eight channels would all be as power hungry as discrete solutions, you would have trouble cooling it. And uh, the last but not least is, is noise. We, we also integrated the current source and a bunch of other features so that as I said, you can actually utilize the footprint, right? It doesn't help you if you make a readout ASIC, but your current sources, which you need are still discrete because then they eat up all the space. So you have to integrate all the functionality which you need into the chip to minimize what else is needed. Okay, and then we have an ASIC test set up in order to test the ASIC alone. Looks like this. So as shown, this is the carrier board. There's this tiny little chip. The thing is like four by four millimeters. Um, it goes into this test board and then the test board has a bunch of, of lab uh, uh, equipment in order to measure it. Um, I usually show a bunch of nice measurements to my electrical engineering colleagues. I skipped those here. The bottom line is this, that this chip performs equally well, slightly faster actually, than the discrete solution that currently is used by our colleagues at MIT, but at a fraction of the power consumption. It has 35 milliwatts per channel where the discrete solution sucks 390. And so that's, that's the big thing. On top of that, it's a lot smaller. And I can show what a lot smaller means. So this is a carrier board for a 2K by 1K CCD. In our business, that's a big CCD. Um, and this is the discrete readout electronics for eight channels, this yellow thing. There in the middle, this spot, that's the ASIC. 
And that ASIC repl replaces all that yellow stuff. And so here we mounted the ASIC badly. We haven't made the measurements yet. Um, this one is the ASIC mounted exactly on that spot. And so you see, you save a lot of space. You save a lot of power. Saving a lot of space also means that the capacitance goes down because capacitance always scales sort of with your physical sizes. You make something smaller. That means the parasitic capacitance goes down and that means that we go faster. Okay. So we just commissioned, this is a rather complicated system. So we just commissioned this, this, this and we are now in the process of combining it with a CCD, which we also have commissioned independently. Okay. Another setup, which we are actually having here in B11 is this one, um, sort of the same, but slightly different thing. So while the previous setup here was really scale, eight channels, big, minimize the capacitance, bring it really close. This setup is more focused on flexibility. So we can take the detector and swap it on the other board you can't. We can take the ASIC, which is on that carrier card, and you actually can swap it. So you can take a different ASIC, you make different combinations. Other thing is we put a bunch of other electronics on this board, the Glock drivers, remember we need faster ones. Um, and we also have a flex lead. Why a flex lead? Because the flex lead has a very high density of signal lines at very high signal integrity compared to uh, uh, a cable. Okay, good. Um, so this is for, for uh, access and the uh, Apex AO. So the next steps is basically the proposal has to go in on November 16. So we are working uh, feverishly on the proposal. And then there might, uh, there will be, uh, there are approximately 10 proposals in play for this call. There will be then a down selection by the mid of next year um, for phase A. And then there would be a development phase until 2027. And then the implementation phase of actually building flight hardware until 2030 for a launch date in 32. Now, uh, another thing, and so this was all about CCDs and classical output stages, in this case as a JFET, but what is if that performance, you know, isn't enough? We, we squeeze the lemon and pretty much that's it, what you can get out of this. So the next one is what we call a Z0. It's still a silicon device, um, but it is not like a classical one. It, it leverages all the technology of a CCD but it also takes some ideas from CMOS sensors and combines them. And so this one um, is basically a transistor structure where the charge is actually under the transistor and you measure it then. This among others uh, change uh, means that you are not writing it out in voltage, you're writing it out in current, but that's a detail. Okay. Um, and so the video waveform of something like this actually looks pretty much the same as previously, but that's actually now current. Um, so you have a baseline, you have a signal, you measure that. Now there's a couple of tricks which you can do. Um, and among others is because this device, when you reset it, it actually empties the internal gate. And so there is no KTC or Poisson noise on that reset process. Empty is empty. And that means that any baselines of, a, of this transistor being empty are the same. And so I can not only take that baseline and that measurement, I can also take the baseline of the next one. And so that means basically I can take for the same time span more information, which results in a better result. And so that is what we did here. Um, and just as an example, so this one gives us at 1.6 microseconds that's comparable to the LSST readout speed, um, 132 AV. Um, and that's first silicon. I mean, these are brand new sensors, first fabrication, and they work beautifully out of the box. Um, good. Another thing which now you can do is you cannot only move the charge under the transistor and empty it. No, you can move it back and then you can move it back again. So you can actually move the charge around and make what is known as repetitive, non-destructive readout. And so this one here, you see this, we did this for nine cycles. Um, and you see in this plot here, you know, baseline one, signal one, baseline two, signal two, baseline three, signal three, and it's always the same. And only at the first is the reset of the pixel and then nine cycles later is the reset of the next one. And so, um, and this is not a comic, that's an actual waveform captured by the AD converter. This is how it looks like. And so when you measure this multiple times, the noise goes down. So you see this here, you have readout noise for one read and then it goes down. And so with our tryout of nine cycles, um, we achieve two electrons noise spectrum of 121. I said, that's 
that's 121 is state of the art performance in silicon. And the readout speed at 16 microseconds isn't, isn't great, but isn't bad either. And this is for the first principle measurements on these new devices. Now, we want to leverage this for the next generation devices. So we are fabricating now CCDs, which will have 16 of these outputs. This will result in a very fast detector, but also into a device that has 16 of these in one row. So you measure the same signal 16 times, and that will enable you sub-electron noise. And so then you can count individual electrons. Why do you want to count individual electrons in x-rays? Well, two reasons. Um, soft x-rays, like 100 EV, that's actually a simulation of 100 EV. 100 EV only makes like 27 electrons. They split across four pixels. You really have to count them in order to recombine the energy properly. The other one is gain calibration. Once you can count individual electrons, your gain calibration is basically reduced to you know, counting the things, and it will happen in situ. Every single observation with your telescope will provide the data to calibrate it for gain. And so you take out a huge uncertainty in, in the calibration factor. Not all of it, but at least from the electronics perspective, you solve the problem. Okay. Obviously, if you have sub-electron noise performance, there are other applications, you know, uh, optical detection or dark matter search experiments. Um, and then last but not least, so at some point you can think about that this with the CCD, you don't need it and you use these transistors actually to make an active pixel matrix. And so you just make many of them and you can individually address this. And we have a, a, a tryout layout. We, we, we looked, you know, is this feasible? Can we do this? And the answer to it is yes, we can. We need the funding, so. Um, okay, so summary. Uh, the group made, I mean, substantial progress in, you know, speeding up from the current state of the art, which will already be employed in AXIS. Um, but also in, in Athena. Uh, and the main thing on Athena is it's a readout chip with 64 channels. It's not super fast, but it's really many channels. Um, and then um, the other one is, so you have seen this a little bit. We are leveraging digital to signal processing, like if the readout for these nine cycles, this is all by waveform sampling. This is all by computation. There's nothing analog going on here, despite the amplification, because you could not easily do this in the analog domain. You need to do it in the digital thing, and that's what we are doing. And then, um, as I said, last but not least, the new C0 technology, um, which we demonstrated the first silicon with, I think, great performance. Um, I mean, now as we progress into the next generation of that, um, will be much better. And we are positive that we can, with the next manufacturing run, achieve sub-electron noise performance on those devices, which opens a bunch of applications in X-rays, but also somewhere else. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Sven. Questions for Sven? So in many other applications, people use CMOS images. Uh, why not use CMOS? So in X-rays, it's actually still quite hard because for X-ray detectors, you need quite thick silicon because you have to stop the X-rays. So you want to have 100 micrometers, 200 micrometers, maybe even thicker. Athena is 500 micrometer thickness. Fully depleted CMOS sensors of that thickness um, with a soft X-ray capable entrance window that are radiation hard against high energy you know, ions basically don't exist. Um, we can discuss why. <laughs> But at the moment, they are not there. You can have thin CMOS sensors, and they would have you know, bad quantum efficiency at the harder X-rays, um, and that more or less kills it. Uh, SAO has a development. I mean, for X-rays, there are three detector technologies being proposed, but this one is the one which is baselined. OK, I thought we saw another question somewhere over there. Still, did you have a question? Yeah. Is there a mic that can? Thank you. Great talk. Um, I wanted to ask you, what do you think, and this might be a very silly question, but I was just wondering if you tried increasing the readout speed even further, do you imagine that you'd hit like a plateau or would it make any difference at all? Well, I mean, you have seen in the plots at four megahertz, 
So Tanmoy actually tried it as five. <laughs> um, but I mean, you have seen when you squeeze this thing, right? It You don't longer have much to measure. I mean, it's just get sort of a mess and your performance start to degrade. You know, first your noise performance degrades gracefully, but at some point you hit this cliff, you know, and, and your measurement just turns into mush and you cannot use it anymore. And then as I said, you have to see why. The reason in this case is as I said, the Glock driver is too slow. Okay, so we need a faster Glock driver, which by itself, you know, this is its own rabbit hole making a faster Glock driver. Um, and the other one is, as I said, the RC time constant, which is the GM of the output transistor times the parasitic capacitance is too small. So you can try to increase GM. You can try to reduce the capacitance. Um, and then, you know, maybe you gain another factor too. It's hard work. Okay, any other questions? Actually, I have one, uh, which is, for the single electron uh, read noise uh, uh, development, is that is that uh, uh, sufficiently timely to be incorporated in Access? Maybe you mentioned this, but I, I didn't quite catch that. Or is this for a future uh, mission, perhaps? So, <clears throat> I mean, if you now have to put in a proposal for an Access mission to NASA, you would baseline a technology that is a Taylor 6, yeah. which is, you know, known, stable, where you can document and substantiate your performance. You would not try. The mirrors are already hard enough. <laughs> so, you know, it's like the detector which is proposed is advanced, is a big step from Chandra, but it's something which more or less is already in the box. And this one is... I think for, for another for, mission yeah. and maybe not a probe, maybe a SMAX, maybe a mid -X. Mm -hmm. Understood. Okay. Uh, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. If not, then let's thank Sven again.